Good evening, everybody, and welcome back, folks. Tom Snyder with you here on the radio show for Tuesday night now. It's the 25th of August, 1992, live and direct out of the Ultimate Broadcasting System here in Los Angeles, California. And joining us tonight from Newsweek magazine and from McLaughlin and Company on television is Eleanor Clift. Glad she's here tonight. She just wound up an interview with Jay Leno over at the Tonight Show across town, dashed across the street to get here, and will join us shortly. Eleanor Clift has been the political and congressional correspondent for Newsweek magazine for the past four years. Like many other political correspondents, Eleanor is just back from Houston and the Republican National Convention there. We'll talk about the right-wing Christian element at the convention, the fact that like many conventions, this was more of a media demonstration than a political convention, also about the differences between the Republicans meeting in Houston this year and the Republicans meeting in 1988. Also tonight, an update on Hurricane Andrew as he, she, it approaches the Louisiana coast. Busy night on the Tuesday night radio show. Okay, we are back. As you know, if you've been listening to the radio today or watching television earlier this evening, Hurricane Andrew, the one that went through Florida yesterday with winds up to 145, 150 miles an hour, is bearing down tonight on the Louisiana coast. They expect it to make landfall about three and a half hours from now, just a little bit to the west of New Orleans, Louisiana. Joining us is Jay Walker. Jay is a reporter for the news department of KPEL Radio, 1420 on the AM dial, 107.7 on FM, our affiliate in Lafayette, Louisiana, with a progress report. Hi, Jay. Thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you, Tom, for uh, for asking us to, to come on. We're uh, we're here in Lafayette, and, and, and we're just kind of waiting right now. We're starting to feel the first effects of the storm. Uh, the winds uh, right now, I guess, are about 20 knots, and we've got some light rain in the area. And, of course, we know that it's going to be quite some time before the wind subsides and the rain goes away. Now, let me ask you a question here. What are they saying about Lafayette? Whereabouts in terms of the storm track are you? Actually, Tom, uh, is if the storm continues on its northwesterly course, we're going to take a direct hit from the storm. We're located about 50 miles west of Baton Rouge, 125 miles west of New Orleans, uh, and about 35 miles as the crow flies from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, I know that you like good news and good copy, but I detect in your voice a sense that you really wish this weren't going to happen. Well... Uh, Tom, you know, I've, I've been living down here for, uh, for over 20 years now, and uh, we've gone through some storms before, but we've never gone through in this area one like, uh, quite like Andrew. Uh, you've got to go all the way back to, to Hurricane Audrey in 1957 and Hurricane Betsy in 1965 to find any kind of storms uh, of this magnitude that came into this area. Uh, no, if we could uh, if we could go outside and uh, and as it blows, if we could uh, blow right back and send it someplace else, we'd be happy to do it. What about precautions in the area right now? How much evacuation is going on? How much boarding up is going on? That sort of thing. All of the all of the coastal parishes that are uh, that are right along the the Gulf Coast have been ordered evacuated and were ordered evacuated early this morning. Those people are gone. Uh, in Lafayette uh, Parish, which is uh, this, uh, just one tier up but also a very low-lying area. Uh, Evacuations were recommended by the mayor uh, about mid-morning today. Uh, Many of the people uh, have left. Uh, Most of them have gone north uh, to Alexandria, about 100 miles from here. Mm -hmm. Others have gone to the seven shelters in the parish. All of those are full. The rest of the the people uh, decided to to go ahead and ride it out, and, and they went ahead and uh, got their ply boards, uh, got their, uh, their foodstuffs, their batteries, their bottled water, uh, and are just going to go ahead and stay at home. It was interesting. I talked to, to one uh, gentleman who, uh, the lumber company here in town, and they went through five uh, 18-wheeler truckloads of plywood in six hours uh, here in Lafayette today. Let me ask you a question. Oftentimes we hear that when this sort of event is about to happen, or in the aftermath of Charleston here a couple, two years ago in South Carolina, all of a sudden, the cost of lumber goes way up. Is there any evidence of price gouging uh, right now in Lafayette? 
Not that we've seen. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, Lafayette is a, t- is a town of about 100,000 people, and it's right in the heart of Cajun country. Uh, and uh, we deal, we're dealing with some pretty honest people here. Uh, and, and no, I, as a matter of fact, I went out and, uh, and bought some plywood myself, and I got six very large sheets of, of good, thick half-inch plywood, and it, it cost me about 50 bucks. Not bad. Now, when the storm is over, that plywood makes a great thing to put your train layout on, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know we'll have some use for it when it's finished. What about the radio station? What about your tower? I mean, could it blow down when this thing comes through? I mean, they're talking 140, 50 mile an hour winds. How sturdy is that broadcasting tower? Up? Well, we're we're hoping that the broadcasting tower will withstand it. You know, we of course build the towers down here with these storms in mind uh, because uh, here on the Gulf Coast we're always susceptible. Um, I've uh, I was I went through Hurricane Carmen back in 19. 19- which had some pretty strong winds as well, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the radio station I was working at at the time uh, never went off the air. We're uh, we've gone ahead and converted here at our studios to generator power. We're also on generator power at our transmitter site, and uh, and we're hoping that we'll be able to stay on throughout. And what about the personnel at the radio station? Have uh, I'm sure you've laid in supplies of you know water, what food you can, because it's highly likely likely that you'll be there through the night. Uh, it's very possible, Tom, that we'll be here for a couple of days. Uh, we have, uh, when, when these storms come in, you plan on being without electricity for a couple or three days. Mm-hmm. So we have plenty of non-perishable food items here, plenty of bottled water. Uh, we have a crew of 13 uh, that are working. Uh, four or five of them are out at uh, various sites uh, throughout Lafayette Parish. Uh, the rest of them are, are here at the studios uh, doing various assignments, including talking to a lot of the people from around the country who have called this evening. Um, but we're, uh, we're, we feel like we're pretty well prepared as far as uh, the broadcast is concerned. Mm-hmm. And of course, our job is just to uh, assimilate as much information and, and get it out to the public as fast as we can get it. Well, the folks, for the folks who are listening to you tonight on 1420 AM or 107.7 FM on KPEL, I would assume that you'll be on through the night. And we'll be on through the night. Uh, we, uh, of course, have, uh, have suspended uh, all normal programming. We're... Uh, uh, in our uh, in our hurricane mode, if you will. Sure, and, I understand. And we'll be uh, and we'll be talking. Uh, we'll be having a continuous broadcast uh, until the storm is over with, or until uh, until the tower falls down, whichever comes first. Yeah. Now, I would expect that you may preempt our show too as you go along tonight, right? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, we have. Uh, we've had to uh, we've had to preempt all of our programming because there is so much information that we need to get out. We also have a staff meteorologist, and we have someone. Uh, from our staff uh, with him, and he's doing uh, five updates an hour, just letting us know exactly what's happening. But right now, uh, things are pretty calm in Lafayette. As I said, the winds are yeah. about uh, 20 knots or so. And what are you carrying on your radio station right now? Uh, right now, uh, we just uh, we just came out of a, uh, a break with our uh, with our meteorologist, and uh, uh, right now we're getting ready to go to, to our news director uh, with an update on uh, on the evacuations, on shelters, uh, and that sort of thing. Okay, wouldn't you know, Jay, that the night you go on to the whole country, they don't even hear you in your own hometown? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Jay, I appreciate your time. Be well and stay safe, okay? Tom, thank you very much. My great pleasure. Jay Walker, reporter for KPEL AM and FM in Lafay- Lafayette, Louisiana, on the air through the night down there advising folks about... Uh, wait, 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 is he still there? Hold it, i got one more question. Jay, I forgot one thing. Hello? Yes. Yeah, if you're 125 miles west of New Orleans, right. would that mean that New Orleans is going to get away clean on this? Oh, no, they're not going to get away clean. They uh, Because the, the storm uh, is moving in a northwesterly oh. direction, they've already had quite a bit of uh, wind and rain, but they're not going to get nearly what they were what they originally thought they would. Okay, thanks again, my friend. All right, Tom. All right, bye-bye. Jay Walker, KPEL Radio in Lafayette, Louisiana, on the approaching storm, Hurricane Andrew, due in there about three and a half, four hours from now. And if the intensity of the storm holds, it'll come in there at about a four, a four-plus category hurricane, the worst or most severe being a category five. By the way, I heard a story on radio coming in here tonight from Miami. The National Guard is on the streets now in South Florida. In many cases, they are trying to stop looters. What goes on in this country when the disaster of this kind occurs that people all of a sudden take to the streets and begin stealing things that do not belong to them? Come on, folks. 
We will continue with Eleanor Clift of Newsweek magazine and tell you more about the Republican National Convention. You probably have not heard enough politics today, so we'll crank it up one notch higher on the uh, Tuesday night radio show after these messages from the local stations. We are back and joined by Eleanor Cliff from Newsweek magazine, where she is the chief political correspondent. Eleanor also appears weekly on the uh, uh, John McLaughlin program, uh, McLaughlin and Company, uh, which is in many areas seen on Sunday morning, although you'll check the listings for time and station. She's been with us many times over the past five years, and when I found out that she was going to be on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, we called and said, Eleanor, please, 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 and she kindly said, I'll, I'll come over. Thanks for coming in tonight. I'm glad to be here. How was the uh, Jay Leno experience for you? Well, when they called this afternoon and asked if I wanted anything special in my dressing room, what, what kind of wine I liked, they said a lot of the guests like to have a glass of wine. <laughs> I began to worry. How relaxed did I have to get? But uh, they are really uh, nice people. They do everything to make you uh, feel at home. And uh, fortunately, I was the last guest, so I, by the time I got out there, I felt like a volcano waiting to erupt. You know, just push a button and out come the, uh, the stories about John McLaughlin. And we started with that, and then we talked politics. So the eight or nine minutes goes by really fast. I was going to say, did you notice that it was over almost before it started, and did you have the feeling? I always do when I do those programs. But I got so much more to say, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Let's go an hour and a half. I know you're just getting into it. Yeah. You're, you're just settling into the chair and feeling comfortable, and it's time to leave. Let me talk to you here about the uh, the newest CBS New York Times poll, which I just heard on radio coming in here about an hour ago, and that puts uh, the, the spread between Mr. Clinton and Mr. Bush back up to around 16%, which is pretty close to what it was before the convention. And the opinion advanced by one commentator on the local station here that whatever bounce came out of the convention has now dissipated. How much stock do you think we can place in these polls at this point in time? Well, I think the polls taken immediately after the president's speech and the convention are really not to be trusted. I mean, people are just tuning in for the first time and, and expressing uh, some opinions. But I think the polls are beginning to settle down, and I think the president really does have to worry that he has not convinced people yet that he's serious, and I question whether he is. I mean, he has put forth these proposals, uh, tax cuts, a jobs training program, without explaining where he would uh, get the money to pay for it. And I, I, I just think that he is giving people a sugar high, and they realize that it's, it's just not for real. The thing that I notice, and by the way, I think that just as the polls after the Republican convention could not be believed, I think that might be said of the polls right after the convention in New York that nominated Bill Clinton, that those polls did not represent the truth as well, to what the American people were thinking. Well, that was an extraordinary bounce, uh, to use the word that the consultants used, that Bill Clinton got. But uh, those polls did not dissipate as quickly as everyone thought. I mean, everybody really did think they were totally artificially inflated, but Clinton has maintained... Uh, this lead, and I, you know, I think what we're now seeing emerging from the Republicans is a strategy to discredit uh, Clinton. I mean, George Bush still has not been able to figure out how to put forward a positive agenda of his own, and it looks as though we're seeing the same old Republican strategy that has worked for them in the past yes, very well to portray the other fellow as too big a risk. To take and uh, it's character assassination and it's misrepresenting uh, Clinton, the Clinton positions. And my favorite is uh, the way George Bush talks about uh, Clinton's record in Arkansas and the number of taxes that he supposedly has levied. I think they've got the count up to 123. When you look at the list, uh, for example, they take gas taxes and they count it twice because it's regular gasoline and diesel. I think they break up, uh, you know, hard liquor and, and wine. Uh, it's, 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 it's bogus. And, uh, you know, the president did not, this is not an honest mistake on the part of the Republican campaign apparatus. I mean, they had to sit around and figure out how to do this. I think we are, you know, looking at a case of, you know, intellectual dishonesty. Let me ask you if there are any sins on the Democratic side. You know, last night here I was talking to a gentleman from uh, Sonoma State College. 
and they have a thing up there, the, the, the best censored stories of the year, where they select ten news stories that they feel have been selectively ignored by the media for whatever mm -hmm. the reason. And this year on the list are all kinds of stuff about the Persian Gulf War, that Saddam Hussein never posed a threat to Saudi Arabia, as the president said. Uh, there's a, another one in there about the Freedom of Information Act and how it's been watered down by the Republicans. And I said to this guy, I said, you know, it seems to me that most of the stories that have, that have been heavily censored are those that, that protect either the Republicans, the president, or corporate America. I said, aren't there any stories about the Democrats? Where they? I mean, well, what about uh, uh, Speaker Jim Wright? And what about uh, uh, George Foley? And what about some of the things, Alan Cranston, the Keating Five? I said, hey, there are a lot of Democrats in trouble, too. So I'm wondering if we're in a campaign where it's only the Republicans who are doing things, uh, um, dirty yeah. tricks type thing, and nothing happening from the Democrats. Well, it depends what you call dirty tricks. Um, I, you know, I think Bill Clinton is is going to try to portray the president as a radical right extremist. Uh -huh. Now, maybe you know that's not fair either. I mean, each side demonizes uh, the other. But I must say, so far, it's the Republicans who are going after Hillary Clinton. The Democrats don't go after Barbara Bush because she's too popular. So a lot of this has to do with the hand that you're dealt. If if Clinton were way behind, he might have to go negative as well. I mean, it's let the me, guy who's behind who usually throws more mud. Let me ask you about Hillary Clinton here. Why shouldn't she be an issue in this campaign? After all, she has injected herself into it. Uh, at some point in time, did did they not say, or did not one of them say, we're a blue plate special, if you elect one, you get us both? Mm -hmm. uh, has it not been said that her husband, if he is elected, will consult with her on certain matters? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But then if you say that, isn't it legitimate for the uh, for the opposition side uh, to, to ask questions about that? And I must admit to you, uh, I think they're being a bit mean-spirited about it. But uh, I do think it's a legitimate issue for discussion. Well, asking questions is one thing, but uh, taking some writings that she did 20 years ago and misrepresenting them is something else. I mean, they uh, routinely say that Hillary Clinton advocates children suing their parents over chores like taking out the garbage. Not now, at all. If you read what she wrote as a law student at Yale 20 years ago, she says, in extremists, uh, where children are abused, where perhaps a child might have a cleft palate that the parents refuse to have uh, fixed, that maybe the rights of these children should be considered in a court of law. I think that's perfectly reasonable. And anybody like Hillary Clinton who has spent time in legal aid clinics and really seen the dark underside of society would take that position as, as in, a, in the natural course of events. I mean, I don't think it's radical. So to take that, to portray her as a radical feminist, I've always, I don't know what a feminist is versus a radical feminist, where the dividing line is, mm -hmm. but uh, to label her that as though somehow she opposes families and she's, you know, not a, a God-fearing uh, mother is, to me, going out of bounds. No question. In fact, the, the supposition, if you looked at the con convention carefully, was that if you voted for a Democrat, you didn't believe in God. And that's preposterous. So I have to pause here for the radio stations. We're talking with Eleanor Clift of Newsweek Magazine and McLaughlin and Company. We will continue after station identification, news on the half hour, whatever. Then we'll be right back. We are back and joined tonight by Eleanor Clift of Newsweek magazine. You know, I keep saying here, I really wish that the two of them, and especially the president, because I do believe he is the transgressor. I detect a certain desperateness in his presentation and in his tone. And there's a certain mean-spiritedness amongst those people who are with the president. But there are some critical issues here. Uh, chief among them, they've got to stop spending money we don't have on things we don't need. They, they're going to spend us broke. I mean, they've already done that, but they're going to spend us into bankruptcy. I think this country's in serious trouble. Uh, you know, I was sitting and having lunch in Beverly Hills today. Three and four storefronts on one street closed down. Gump's, the legendary West Coast department store with branches in San Francisco and California, now in Beverly Hills, is closed down. I mean, this is the result of four years and more of inattention to reality in this country. 
So when the recession hits Beverly Hills, you know you're in trouble. The recession it's been in the inner cities for a long time, right. and uh, you know that uh, the politicians could ignore. But when it hits places uh, where they shop and they have lunch, uh, conceivably they might start paying some attention. But you know the deficit and cutting cutting the deficit is not a winning political issue. And you didn't hear much talk about that in the president's acceptance speech. Instead, he's, he's talking about tax cuts and giving more money away. I mean, it is totally irresponsible. And then they say the details will be made available in January when he presents his budget. Um, you know, if people look at that, I just don't think they're going to take him seriously. I mean, I, I guess I have faith in the public that they are going to send this president a message <laughs> in November that you can't get away with this anymore. Now, Bill Clinton's economic plan is nothing to write home about either. Right. He leaves a lot out, but he has not foreclosed any options like declaring unequivocally he will never raise taxes, you know, read my lips. I mean, that was the, 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 the lowest thing that George Bush did. I mean, he has really crippled every politician's ability to levy any kind of uh, taxes in this country for you know time to come, and uh, nobody wants to cut programs, and so meanwhile we just cut quality of life and services. Let me ask you a question here. It almost sounds as if you, and I read your work in the magazine. It almost sounds and reads as if you are cheering for Bill Clinton to win. Ah. Uh. You know, I like to think that I can analyze this race, but I and I think that uh, that I can a analyze it fairly. Um, I think that I could very well go to bed on election night and George Bush will be reelected. But I think that I can speak for a lot of people, Republicans included, that I don't think the country will feel real good about itself if they reelect this president. Now, if that's cheering for Bill Clinton. Um, but what, I don't know if that really counts. And, and help me here. I don't know if because you work for uh, Newsweek magazine, you are supposed to have a certain objectivity about this, or in the new journalism, do you have license to be subjective? Because you do write subjectively in your magazine. Right. Um, I think the direction of journalism, uh, first of all, I think total objectivity is impossible. Um, we all bring our our particular set of circumstances and our biases, I'll use the word, to uh -huh. whatever we write. And generally at Newsweek, we are encouraged to bring a voice and a point of view uh, to our stories. Um, I think that I have given the George Bush a, a fair shot in what I write. And uh, in my public pronouncements, particularly on the McLaughlin group, um, I guess, like everybody else on that show, I have become some, something of a caricature. And I don't think there's anybody who watches that show that thinks either Jack Germond or I are registered Republicans. So I will, <laughs> I will admit to that. I am not a registered Republican. Right. Okay. But there is a perception in the land um, especially amongst conservatives and amongst many people, that somehow the media is ultra-left, that somehow the media is against honest conservatism, that somehow the media is going to bash George Bush and bash George Quayle and present uh, Bill Clinton and, Dan and, and, uh, and uh, Al Gore as knights on white horses. Yeah, the problem with that criticism is, look earlier. I mean, Bush is, Bush, Bush is now running oh, against the oh, media. Sure, yeah, and, and, and in Houston, uh, young Republicans would march through the press room uh, chanting, tell the truth, tell the truth. And the president even did a little media bashing in his acceptance uh, uh -huh. uh, speech. Um, I don't think the criticism holds up, because if you remember earlier this year, it was Bill Clinton who was being you know, carved into little pieces by the press. I mean, I did my share of that. I wrote a piece that was very critical of his record in, in Arkansas. Arkansas, right. And, uh, you know, I, I am not uh, blinded by the fact that he is a Democrat. I mean, I think he's got lots of flaws, and we're going to examine them. Uh, but the notion that we're cheering for Bill Clinton and we're not, we're covering up anything negative is just, it, you know, right now the Clinton campaign happens to be making a number of very smart moves. I mean, the bus trip extended the glow of the convention, and it's George Bush's campaign who has, uh, which has been really disorganized. They had to call in, you know, Jim Baker, mm -hmm. Secretary of State. Uh, giving up that job to go run the campaign out of the White House, which, by the way, it raises a few eyebrows. By the way, that's in clear yeah. violation of constitutional ethic, and as a matter of fact, such conduct would not be permitted under California law. You mm -hmm. cannot have a, you cannot have a, um, 
you cannot have a pay, you, you can't have the chief of staff of any elected official in California running his campaign for re-election. That's not allowed under California law. It's mm-hmm. against the law, and it ought to be against the law nationally. I mean, to 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 consider that the White House chief of staff, the man responsible for who sees the president and who doesn't, the man who sets the agenda for the president of the United States, is also running his political campaign, well, is in my view a direct violation of ethical behavior. Right, and they're also putting out the fact that uh, in a second term that Jim Baker might be the economic czar. I mean, this is the man who's going to deliver us all, including George Bush. And if he does win, maybe it's Jim Baker who ought to move into the Oval Office. Actually, I would feel pretty good about that. By the way, what about Clinton's record in Arkansas? Can can he run and keep that record in the background, or will that Will that loom as a possible negative in his campaign? Oh, I think that the Bush campaign, their first round of advertisements, will probably focus on Clinton's record in Arkansas. Which is they okay. Will, yeah. Which is fine. And, uh, you know, he needs to be able to defend that best best he can. And it, it's a mixed record. It's a very poor state, and he's taken it from, you know, 50 to 47 in a number of categories. And the joke in Arkansas is, thank God for Mississippi, or else uh, Arkansas <laughs> would be last. Uh <laughs> But he's, he's been an innovative gov- governor. He has tried, and he does have some uh, things that he can point to that that people will admire. But uh, there's plenty there to uh, to attack, and, and I'm sure the Bush campaign will, will be doing that. Do you know what I find so fascinating about Bill Clinton? Remember, uh, he was the buffoon of the 1988 Democratic Convention when he, when he wouldn't get off in Atlanta. That's right. He delivered it was a, what was it, I think it was a... 33-minute speech, a nominating which speech. was a nominating speech, went on way too long. By the way, it was a, they, it was a seconding a nomination. Right. I think they even turned off the teleprompter in, in an effort uh, to get him off the podium, and the only applause he got was when he said, in conclusion, you know who made the, the, the equal, an equal fool of himself at the Republican convention was Senator Phil Graham, who was supposed oh, yeah. to deliver the uh, the keynote that yeah. uh, would set the stage for his presidential campaign uh so that may have been strangled in the crib. By the way, Clinton has a problem making a short speech, I think. Oh. Remember, remember at the convention, and even Bush went way too long, and Clinton, these guys go on forever. I mean, you know. Well, at least Bush, by speaking for almost a solid hour, took away one of his uh, attacks against Clinton, because the, the Bush people have been making lots of fun of Clinton for speaking for 53 minutes, mm-hmm. and then George Bush went even uh, longer. Uh, Clinton has a problem focusing his thoughts. That's true. I mean, he is, we've used the, the phrase in Newsweek, he's a policy wonk. He knows a lot about <laughs> issues, and he wants to tell you all about it. The five-point proposal, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the, the example that happened to him, and what his mother thinks about it. And he, What time is it, and here's how I'm with the right. watch. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. right. So uh, I think he's working on uh, getting down into soundbite uh, territory. He needs to do that for the debates. We, uh, he also needs to lose 20 pounds first. Now, is McLaughlin still fooling around with the ladies, or is that all over? Oh, that's all over, if it ever existed. hes I think he's more oh, no, more, no, more talk than action. No, no, no. no. Some, one of his former employees nailed him on sexual harassment here about four or five years ago. Uh, well, yeah. he did have a lawsuit against him, which was settled out of court. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't heard anything. You know, I'm, I'm a character witness for him. He's okay. Is he? Okay. <laughs> okay. He, by the way, he is the caricature on that show. <laughs> We are with Eleanor Clift of Newsweek Magazine. I'm going to open the phones here. We'll start taking your calls at 800-756-0852, the toll-free line. Coming up later on tonight on many of these same stations, the actress and Emmy Award winner Dana Delaney is here. Tonight my guest is Eleanor Clift, and we will continue after station identification. We are back chatting tonight with Eleanor Clift of Newsweek Magazine. Um, I know that you're a political correspondent, but does the length of the campaign burden even those who cover it and derive their income and their professional satisfaction from covering campaigns? I mean, this thing's been going on since uh, since February. Tom, um, this is the shortest campaign we've had in a long time. This has been under a year. It really didn't get started until January. Look back to 88 mm-hmm. and uh, the Gary Hart shenanigans went on, I believe, in 87. We were well underway yeah. two years before. So yeah. by... Recent standards, this is blissfully, blessedly short. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You have a hand in a little column in Newsweek called CW, Conventional Wisdom. Mm -hmm. How has the CW turned around here since uh, since now that both conventions are over? For example, Barbara Bush, uh, 
she was always thought of as the kindly grandmother, but she's seen in a different light right now, according to CW Convention. Yeah. Wisdom. Well, she's kind of granny got your gun. I mean, I yeah. think uh, <laughs> people understand that Barbara Bush is a lot tougher than her image. And uh, she's also being used in a very calculated way by the campaign. I mean, the uh, platform was extreme to the right. They favor a constitutional amendment that would have banned abortion. They even voted down a plank that would have expressed compassion for the victims of rape and incest. Then Barbara Bush gives an interview to the news magazines and says, Mm -hmm. I don't think abortion should even be in the platform. So that's the kind of the wink and the nod, hey, we're not really all that extreme. And uh, Barbara has come out on uh, the traditional family and said, you know, we're not just for the traditional family. Whatever you call family, we're for it. So she's the... The softening agent. She's the, uh, the, the, well, she's right. the, she's the good cop. She's the good witch. <laughs> Marilyn Quayle is the bad witch. <laughs> <laughs> What's the CW on Mrs. Quayle? Uh, I, see I, her, was, I see her as a very frustrated woman. Right. I would say, uh, you know, bitter housewife <laughs> resents having to give up her law, law career. Uh, for Marilyn Quill to get out there and express solidarity with the nation's homemakers is really, uh, it is so hypocritical because this woman, the, the, the bitterness that emanates from her over having to shelve her career to uh, play ceremonial wife, I mean, that has really been there. And she, you know, turned to novel writing. And mm-hmm. She's produced a, a kind of a grade B novel on the side with her mm-hmm. sister. I mean, she has the same need to so-called fulfill herself that the rest of us have okay we're going to the phones here's bob in uh seattle hello hey good evening tom good evening bob yeah long time listener i've tried to call a number of times lucky enough to get through Thank thanks you. um my i guess my comment is or my question it's really disheartening to listen to all of the rhetoric that the politicians put out without any hard substantive facts or or programs you know i guess I'm, I'm kind of tired of listening to. Uh, my question is, what's going to, what does a woman's right to choose or not choose an abortion? How is that going to help us get out of the the four trillion dollar national debt we're in? How's that going to turn the economy around? What's it going to take to get these guys to listen? It seems though most of your guests talk about the the lack of of issues that the 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 two candidates are talking about. How do we get them to turn around and start talking about that? Well, the press can force the dialogue to a certain extent, and I think we will be doing that. And the debates, uh, there should be two or three of them in the fall, will also Mm -hmm. produce some discussion about issues. But the agenda is really set by the candidates and principally by the incumbent president. I mean, he has the power of the bully pulpit. And George Bush really does not have the courage to run on the economy because the economy isn't doing squat. So they are trying to change the subject, and they've been doing very well at that. Well, you know, it seems for years we've elected, uh, I, I kind of call it fluff, instead of uh, rock-hard facts, but, and it, it's just disappointing. Well, just a, a little side comment. I saw a couple of uh, bumper stickers that I really liked the other day. One of them says, make it a clean sweep, re-elect nobody. <laughs> and the other one says, two-term limit, one in Congress, one in jail. <laughs> I'm not certain that that's not all together off the board. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you, sir. All right, bye-bye. John Akron, Ohio, hello. Hello. Yes, sir. How are you doing tonight, Tom? Fine, John. I just want to tell you something. You're right when you say that Rush Limbaugh's only objective in life is to get Bush in office. He's become a shill for the White House. Yep, and I just, I, I love UIB, let me tell you that. But, no thing. But let me say something here, okay? Yeah. What is Herzegovina going to mean to the president come election time? Uh, well, I think that uh, the president wants to keep the lid on these foreign hot spots. He really does not want to get involved in what is essentially a civil war over there. And maybe by the intent of your question, you mean, should we even be talking about Bosnia, Herzegovina, should we be focusing on domestic issues? And I think that to a large extent that uh, the dialogue here at home 
uh, does really want to focus on what's going to happen less in our lives. I don't think you're going to see Bush discussing much foreign policy at all during this campaign because he's been tacked with the label of being a, a foreign policy man and not a domestic man. But That's, he spent a large portion of his acceptance speech sort of set, yeah. setting himself up as the victorious foreign policy. Did you, know, you notice Gorbachev? that the name of Mikhail Gorbachev never came up during the discussion of the, the fact that they now are having a freedom in the Soviet Union or whatever it is over there? Not, never once was Gorbachev's name mentioned this great partner of ours never right, once. right well i guess uh, he was he's a bit player compared to the role that george bush played <laughs> joan penfield illinois hi yes hi con yes hi. eleanor hello my question is uh uh why is the media so biased in favor of bill clinton yeah that's a question that i think that the white house has planted in the public's mind oh, because no. if you'd asked the same question three no, months no, ago when we were writing that bill clinton was Eleanor, dead meat that he Eleanor was the that he was the most vulnerable Today's democratic uh, candidate Today's in show. years al gore ten minutes mcneil air tonight al gore ten minutes good morning america perot ten minutes well, Perot is yet another candidate. Uh, that's not biased towards well, wait, uh, Bill Joe Clinton. Well, how much time no, did the president no, no. get? Al Gore. <laughs> we see Al Gore. We saw Clinton during the uh, camp, the Republican uh, convention. Okay, gentlemen's agreement. They don't do that. Joan, let me tell you something. How it works. I mean, if George Bush would come on this radio show, I'll give him three hours. Uh, I mean, if if uh, if Dan Quayle will come on this show and talk to you, the people, take your calls. I'll give him three hours, as would anybody else. I know. The, 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 by, by, oh, 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 the okay, okay, okay. You know, we are limited. We ask people to come on if they don't want to. Like Bush, Bush and Quayle, a lot of times, they don't want to go on these programs. May I say one more thing? You can, but mm -hmm. let me do the commercial first. I'll be right okay. back to you. Okay, we will continue after these messages. Okay, Joan, uh, where were we? Oh, I don't know, okay. But you, oh, wanted, you wanted to say something, and I'm going to give you the opportunity. Go ahead. Okay. All I know is I got my news week today. Mm-hmm. And uh, one article in there calling the Republican vet Convention a, fe a feast of hate and fear. Now, Eleanor, I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you something. I'm an average American. You know, the average American, if you know any, are very fed up with the media. We're tired of your opinions. When you told us tonight that you're given a freelance to verbalize your opinions, you're also very involved with the conventional wisdom. I couldn't understand why it was so skewed, but now I know. Well, uh, we're not interested in your opinions. We have our own. Give us the facts. We don't want subjective adjectives that comes out in the news media can I, all the time. Can, can I ask you a question? Yes. Do, do you think uh, the fact that the uh, Democrats did not use the word God at their convention is a fact? That, no. That, that, that's worth... Con well, uh, fine. No, 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 no. I, you know, every, you know... Look at the adjectives and how they describe the candidates. Okay, I've been writing them down. I'm tired of hearing passive style of Bush. I'm tired of hearing attack on the Republican side. Okay? Mm -hmm. Look at the subjective adjectives. These are subjective. Me, These are personal right. How would you describe the president's uh, governing style? If you didn't use passive, how would you describe describe it? You wouldn't call him an interventionist, well, well, would well, you? Well, no, no. How, how would you describe the president's yeah. style of running the government, John? Um, I would say frustrated. Okay. Anyway, Joan, I'll tell you, you know I'm down to time here. I'd love to carry this on are, further. And I, thank you very much. And I thank you for calling. And and, uh, and I love the McLaughlin group. I love the Beatle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good night, Joan. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. It's been thank great you. fun, Eleanor. Thanks for making us part of your visit to California. Well, thank you. I was glad to be okay, here. Okay, and thanks okay. for all your help over the years. Eleanor Clift of Newsweek Magazine here on the radio show for Tuesday night. Thanks for listening, everybody. Mm -hmm.